everyone to Seek, Go, Create. This is where we redefine success in leadership, business, and ministry. And what I've been saying recently is this is the place for the seekers, for the goers, and the creators, those folks that are wanting to create impact on people's lives. And so thank you for joining us. I appreciate it very much. We're about to get to our guest, but I just want to say this is your host, Tim Winders. I have had an incredible morning. I'm coming to you live from the, the RV Theo in the passenger seat at 65 degrees. I've had a couple cups of coffee, done my intermittent fasting. And so I am jacked up. I'm just trying to be cool and calm and collected because I'm excited about this conversation we're going to have today. So welcome, welcome all of you to Seek, Go, Create. In 2013, our guest's life was drastically changed. While stopped at a red light on the highway, he was reared by a box truck that failed to stop. The images are horrific and amazing. As a result, he was considered dead until first responders saw his hand move. He received many injuries that day, burns on his body. After years of surgery and rehab, Cody has chosen to not allow his scars to keep him bound to bitterness and defeat. Instead, he uses his story to uplift others. He's also a speaker. He's an author. But I want you all to welcome Cody Burns to Seek, Go, Create. Cody, welcome. Oh, thank you, Tim. Glad to be here. Excellent. Now, I gave you a little bit of warning for this, but my first question is usually, what do you do? Because I'm talking to business people and I want, I, you know, I give the bio and all that, but I can tell you, I was spending time, I read your book yesterday, spending time in prayer this morning, and I do not think that question is appropriate. I want, I mentioned it in the bio, I want just right out of the gate for, for you to just mention and tell us about, and we'll go into it in more details a little bit later, but what happened May 31st, 2013? Yeah, May 31st, 2013, I was stopped at a red light on the highway. And the last thing I remember was driving. And then I wake up out of a coma three weeks later. So what I'm told by first uh, responders and witnesses in the police reports is that I was hit by a box truck, a refrigerator box truck that did not stop at the red light. On impact of the, of the box truck hitting my, uh, I was in a Dodge Durango at the time. On impact of that hitting my Dodge, my vehicle blows up into flames. It was pushed through the intersection into an embankment, and it would be there when uh, the fire department came, and they said just by the looks of it, they could tell it's it's a fatality. Um, it wasn't until you know later on that they saw my hand move, and that little bit of movement changed everything for me. Yeah, and, and I actually, from your book, I hope it was okay. I probably should have gotten permission. I, I think I had that image where you circled that hand that I didn't recognize the vehicle. Truthfully, I tried to look at those images and it was un indistinguishable, undistinguishable. I don't know if that word is right, but you know, it, you could not tell that it was really even a vehicle. So, um, all right, so here's, I've got so many places I would love to go with this Cody and and again, I did read your book yesterday, so there's a lot of things from that, and we'll talk about that later. I'm going to recommend people get the book also, but I want to back up, and I would love for you to tell people about Cody before that date, and then I think a lot of the value of our conversation is going to be what happened after, but I want to kind of set the stage now before. Can we just back up? I mean, listen, I saw some things. Juggler, clown. I mean, come on. Juggler and clown in the same sentence? <laughs> I know, right? Go figure. What are the odds of that? Yeah. No, I, uh, so I grew up in southern Indiana. A country boy. Great family. Great community. Everyone in my hometown. I still love them very dearly. Um, I, it was amazing. What can I say? And at a young age, I went to church very involved in my church, uh, give my life to Christ at a young age. And I went to a kid's camp, let's say about age 11. Oh, well, I'll backtrack and say that as far as the juggling and stuff, my family took me to the circus whenever I was really young. And I remember seeing these, the clowns and I'd seen the jugglers. And so to me as a little boy, I was just fascinated by that. And I told my parents, I said, I want to learn how to juggle. And uh, so you know, I, they took me and bought me some juggling balls and I taught myself how to juggle. And, you know, over time I got better at it, but I started using that in ministry because I seen somebody use that. Uh, we had a vacation Bible school. We had a clown that came, he juggled and he 
you know, preach the gospel. Then it was a kids camp. We also had a speaker that was a juggler. He was actually a missionary. I think it was from Spain. And, but he had his whole family and he juggled, but it was how he presented the talents with the message and it broke the ice. It grabbed, you know, everyone's attention. And I was like, someday I, like I knew on the inside, it was like God in that moment said, this is what I'm calling you to do. And so as, you know, as a little boy, I was always very focused on what God was going to, you know, be doing in me. So I, I was always doing entertainment things. I mean, I, <laughs> I was started out doing the birthday parties. I did the fairs and then, you know, I, I, I did have a, a slight fascination with circus stuff. And so I never did join a circus, but I did a couple dates where you would fly out to a city, do a show, and then you come right back. But um, after high school, I went to a ministry program. I really felt like God, once again, was just, that's, that was the main focus. And so I went there. It was a dis- discipleship program for nine months, Rockford, Illinois, and went there. I completed that. And then I came back to my home church and became a children's pastor. And at the same time of being a kid's pastor, I took additional classes out of Indianapolis to get my pastoral credentials. And so I was doing that full-time ministry as a kid's pastor, but also evangelism. And so I was just very active doing things around the country, kids camps, conferences, you name it. Uh, So life was going very good, but I was always very focused on the vision and what I believe God was having me to do. I knew that someday, whatever it is that God's wanting to do, it was going to be international. And I knew it was yeah. going to be a lot of people. I didn't quite see how, uh, but, you know, here I am. Eight years uh, later, since uh, May 31st, I was 23 at the time when all that went down. I was 23 years old, very young. Uh, so as, at, at a young age, I was very focused, you know, on what I wanted to do. And so here's a yeah here's a question and some of this i've had to go through with some things never never the type challenge that you did but i you know i was wired for business and 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 then had a lot of that stripped away but what i I would really like to understand mindset i like to get inside things that help help us change help us you know, uh, really make changes in our lives. And I actually know I had someone reached out to me, reach out to me last night, say, I've got a lot of scars. I really want more information and want to listen in when you guys talk. So I hope that, uh, I hope that she's listening in right now, but tell me about your mindset, you know, 23 years old. Um, you know, you, you're, you're performing, you're in front of people, you're doing things from the, for the Lord, probably, you know, in church circles, we use words like calling. I'm a kingdom of God guy. I use the word assignment. I, I think it's, they're related, but a little bit different, but did you believe that you were walking in the steps and the place and the assignment and the calling that God had for your life at that time? I do. And it's, it, and that's a great question. I, I love that because I don't often get to go into such detail whenever I do the podcast. Um, I, I knew that I knew that, that my time at the church was going to be temporary. And I, cause I knew that whatever God was having me or going to be doing, it was going to be traveling. It was going to be um, more than just a stationary place. However, I was very fortunate to be at a church that allowed me that privilege to go and do stuff like that. Uh, But I felt actually right up until, I'd say probably two weeks right before the wreck, um, I was in a staff meeting with my pastor and some of the other pastors, and we was praying over the request in the church. And I had felt for a while that transition, like something on the inside said, Mm -hmm. like, you know, you're, 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 you're about to wrap up here. And, and it was in that staff meeting where I just really, I broke down and it was like, God just saying, you know, your, your, your time has, has come to a close here. And so I had told my pastor and informed him. And so it was one of those times. And, and so I didn't officially step down. We hadn't gotten to that part, but he, he at least knew what was going to be happening. And so, and then sure enough, two weeks later, I get hit by this box truck. And so it was, um, very interesting. I'll say that. Yeah. And, and the reason I, to me, the reason that's important, Cody, is that I'm a big believer that our time here on earth is a process. It's not an event. It might be a series of events that sort of define us, but it's a process. 
And, and listen, you, you speak so well in your book about all the questions you went through spiritually. We're going to get into a lot of that here shortly. And, and the great literal and metaphor that you use about scars that, that I want to ask you about, but I, I, you know, when, when we believe that there's transitions coming up in our lives, we like to think that we have some degree of control over those. Prior to May 2013, were you one that thought you had a high level of control over your life, a mid-level, low level? See, I'm, I'll admit I'm a high control guy that, you know, when I really get off track is when I think I have a lot more control than I don't. Where do you fit on that spectrum? Talk a little bit about control. Yeah, I think it's it's a, just a natural human tendency, just in general, I mean, to want to control things and control the outcomes. And and I did certainly, I mean, I, I, I would say, if anything, more like a mid. Um, but it was also a time where I knew that, you know, if, if anything was going to happen, it would have to be a move of God. And I mean, it's still like that, too. I can control things to a point, but at the end of the day, you know, it, it's what God wants. And so, but yeah, I, I would say mid-level. Okay, so, so mid-level control guy, this event occurs. Let's move kind of beyond the May 31st event. And, uh, and, and I, I don't want to get into all the details here because you do a great job in the book and we'll have links and everything for people. But I would like to get, I think you were in a coma for I think six to eight weeks or something like that. And then you came out of it. And a lot of this was just people telling you what happened and all that. But can you, can you share with us, and especially now you've had time to reflect, but what were first thoughts, first reactions? Because many times the way we react to situations begins this cascading effect that occurs. First thoughts, first things that go through your mind, share as much as you can thinking back on it. Yeah. Uh, so the accident happened May 31st. And I always tell the story of because I came out of the coma on June 19th. So it was, it was about three weeks or so. And my, the doctors had told my family that, you know, Cody can hear everything that you're saying. And so my family was very protective of me in the unit and my mother, and my father, their brothers, everyone being there. But my mom, I remember uh, very little um, while I was in a coma, but I do remember briefly some of her prayers. Um, she spent a lot of time praying over me. But whenever I came out of the coma, she was there. She taught, and my whole family was, but her specifically, I talk about, she told me, you know, Cody, you know, you've been hit by a box truck. Um, your you know, vehicle exploded into flames. You have severe burn injuries you know, 40% of your body severely burned. My face had second degree burns. I had third and I had fourth degree burns. I never knew there was such a thing. But what that is, is it burns through all of your fat cells down to bone and muscle. And in some cases it requires amputation. So uh, the very severe injuries, I had broken vertebrae. I had a blood infection in the unit. I had uh, two types of pneumonia, hematomas, all kinds of stuff that happened. But she's telling me all these things. And she told me, she said, you know, Cody, no matter what, don't lose sight of your vision. Your worldwide ministry has begun. Uh, and, I, and those words just always stick, stick to me. And I'm just thinking to myself how so often in life, we all need those people when life takes a hit to remind us to keep our focus on the vision and what is most important. And so, but after her telling me all those things, I won't lie, you, you go in and out of emotions. One moment, I'm thankful to be alive. The next moment, you're like, did I do something wrong to deserve this? You know, God, why, why, why did this happen? This wasn't, this wasn't part of the plan. You know, here I am trying to do everything I can right. I'm not perfect by any means, never have been, never will be, but I was on that path of trying to serve you, God. This is not, this, you know, you hear that verse, you know, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, give you hope in the future. What, what about those verses? What about that? Here I, here I am. And I'm now in a, you know, wrapped like a mummy, soaking with blood and fluid and bandages. And, and so you have those natural thoughts. And I, I fought depression, but at the same time, I was, I was grateful to be alive. And I had an amazing fam, uh, my family, the community, a great support system that encouraged me in those dark hours. 
And two, also, because news about this spread, the news got a hold of it. My family started a Facebook page, just hearing the comments and what people were saying. It was in, inspire, encouraging to me to keep going, keep moving forward. And I had to get to that place of where, you know, understanding that ultimately my vision was to always bring hope to people, you know, the message of Jesus and who Jesus is. And then this life, we're not promised to have it all easy. Um, but we can cling to him when moments get tough. And so while that was the message. I was like, all right, I'm going to use this to my advantage. Um, and that was quite life-changing. Yeah. And all right. So there's two questions that I wanted to spin off from that. The first one, you mentioned your mother <clears throat> and you mentioned growing up, I, I guess, in a church home. And I, I'm, I'm going to say this and I, gosh, I want it, I want it to come across as sensitive as possible. And I'm, I think hopefully my heart will come through there are people that have really no spiritual foundation and some of them may be listening in and, and you know they they just they don't have that yet or they have chosen not to then there are people that are we'll call them church people they visit they go they're there and then there are people that have relationship with their creator <laughs> there are people that are really uh, attempting to interact. And it sounds to me like definitely your mother, maybe your family were in that latter category. Would I be correct? Oh yeah. Without question. And how important was that during this process? I mean, it was extremely important. I mean, cause you know, in those, in those times, I mean, that's really when your, your world is rocked, your faith is put to the test. And, you know, it's no longer, it no longer is this ritual that people find themselves in. If they're going to church, all right, life is great. It's a good Sunday morning. We'll grab our coffee. We'll sit in worship service and we'll just have a dandy time. But then when you're in this kind of situation, uh, which most people at some point in their life, they find themselves with devastating news or discouraging news, maybe not to this extent, you know, God forbid, but still it's like, all right, you know, now I'm going to pray. I'm going to give it my all you know, God, hear me out. And um, yeah, you kind of, you, you know, it, it has to be genuine in those times. Yeah, that's good. And so my follow up to that, you sort of alluded to it, but I want to dig just a little bit deeper. And that is your mindset. Because I know that there were probably steps along the way where you know, if we were looking at a scale, you know, your, your faith one to 10 that you, we probably shouldn't rank it that way, but you know, at times, you know, eight and a half, nine, 10, and then at times maybe five or below. Um, did you ever blame, lash out, cry out, uh, you know, or was it just a uh, why, I mean, what were the conversations that you were having with God that maybe you would have rather someone not know those conversations? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, I mean, there was some very dark times. I mean, I, I won't lie. I don't, I never got mad where I would curse God, but I certainly did wonder why. And I got frustrated because I always had this vision to help people and, you know, you're trying to do all these things right. And then this happens. And so, you know, it's, it's normal. And I'm so grateful that we have a God that's not intimidated by our humanity. Um, all the people in the Bible, they certainly had their moments. God allows for that. But in the end, he knows our heart and he will, you know, wrap us with his warmth and grace in those moments. And, but I did, I, I had my, my times where I'm just, you know, God, why don't you just take me? You know, I had those moments later. I remember going in my, laying in my bedroom, wrapped up in um, these uh, splints that they had me in with therapy. I also had to wear a full body, almost like a full body spandex suit. But this, these garments were extremely, they were compression garments. And, you know, I had to be in those for, my goodness, it seemed like eight months to a year after all this happened, just to help with the scarring. And, you know, day in, day out, and I'm just like, you know, God, just, just here I am, you know, I'm, I'm thankful that I'm alive, but if, if this is all that it's going to be, then Lord, you know, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm okay. Um, so you go in and out of those emotions, but, you know, but I certainly did wonder why that was the big thing. I, and, and you, you, your natural thought process is all right. Did I do something wrong to deserve this? Is God punishing me? And I think a lot of people find themselves 
in that frame of mind when tragedy strikes. Yeah, and that's a that's a theological question. You address it some, but I'm going to ask it here because I think I think someone listening might be asking that same question. So I'm going to throw it back to you and say, was God punishing you? So the way I answer that, I mean, it get, this can get very deep. And Let's go. Different <laughs> perspectives, and so in, in the Christian world, we talk about apologetics. And if anybody is listening or watching this, I encourage you to look up apologetics. And it's basically uh, defending why you believe the way you do. And they address some of these very challenging questions. Now, obviously, we will never know all the answers this side of heaven. But there is, to some extent, a lot that makes sense as to why these things take place. I don't believe God was punishing me. I really don't. And I'll start that conversation by saying what one of my mentors said, Dr. Dave Reaver. He is also a burn survivor. He served in Vietnam as he uh, was going to throw a hand grenade. A sniper shot the hand grenade and it blew up all over his body. And so, you know, after all this, you know, he has his fingers amputated, his face is scarred. He's, you know, it was devastating to him, but he came back to the States and as he's recovered, you know, he dealt with suicidal thoughts depression, you know, and he was doing a TV. He told me, I spoke with him over the phone, a pastor in Illinois connected us. And he said, you know, Cody, I was on, it was on TBN. And he said that Jan Crouch, I guess was the woman that asked him this. She said, you know, live TV. She said, Dave, do you know why God allowed this to, or to happen? And she, or he said at the time, Cody said, it frustrated me that she would ask me this on live TV. And, uh, but he said, her words changed my life. And her words were this, Dave, God did not do this to you, but he allowed it to happen because he could trust you with the scars. And it changed his entire life from that moment on. And he's had a powerful ministry that has reached, I would say, darn near many, many thousands, if not millions up to this point in his life. Great guy. Uh, and so from that, I believe that we live in a world where we live in a fallen world because of sin sin entering in, and we have the ability to make choices. We have free will. I believe God is he's sovereign. He is in control. And ultimately, everything that happens is because he, you know, says or allows it to happen. But he gives humanity that right to make decisions. We have free will to love God or to not love God, to go to church, to not go to church, um, to, you know, drive a box truck or not drive a box truck. And so I think about the driver of the truck that hit me. He was operating in free will. Just so happens that day, he wasn't paying attention. And because of his poor choice, I had to live with the consequences of it. I don't believe God did it to me. I believe he allowed it. God knew it was going to happen. He also knew that the outcome of what it was going to be. And so I have to trust him. And then there are cases where people say, well, I know so-and-so. They had this happen to them, and they didn't make it. They're not alive. And so my comment to them is, you know, what's said in Isaiah is that his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. He sees things and he knows things that we do not. He knows our beginning and our end. Just like with COVID-19, he knew it was, you know, he understood everything was going to happen. I remember at the beginning of 2020, I'm thinking, God, why, why is there not many doors opening? You know, it was a slow start. And then long and behold, here we have it. All this happens. And so I, we just have to trust him. In, 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 when it all boils down to, and then to understanding eternity, going back to understanding that this life is truly a training ground. It's very temporary. Uh, there's that, the, the saying I love, you know, life is short, death is certain, but eternity is long. Someday we're all going to die. If we live a hundred years on this earth, we say, well, that's a long time, but it's nothing compared to eternity. And so when you think in from that frame of mind, you understand that everything in this world is temporary you can be a multimillionaire, you can have all the success and fame that you want, but at the end of time, it's not going to amount to anything. Uh, it's nothing compared to the joy and the peace and the love that we're going to experience in heaven in the presence of God. And so when you think that way, even those people that, let's say they don't make it, if their heart is in the right place with God, they're in a better place than what we are. So it's, it's uh, just reframing the entire situation. So I, I don't believe God did this to me. I, I believe he allowed it to happen. I believe it, it ultimately enhanced the vision that he has for my life. 
and he it, it's opened up a lot of doors and there has been hundreds of thousands of people that have been exposed to this story and the message therefore i am very honored and grateful that god would use some crazy little country boy that likes juggling and clowns to do such a thing and so <laughs> i'm very blessed you know that's good and uh, i was thinking of a couple of things there and I guess one of the biggest things, and I'll just go ahead and pose this as a question. Do you think that we often attempt to explain the unexplainable? <laughs> you know, are, are we trying to wrap something up? I'll tell you how I explain the unexplainable. You referenced it in the book, Romans 8, 28. That's how I explain the unexplainable. And and one of the things that you have done is that you did a great job of talking that we need to think long term, not, you know, boy, I hope I'm going to be blessed this weekend, you know, three days, four days later. So I love the long term. But do you think as individuals, as culture, as even church people, as Christians, as leaders in, in society, we attempt to explain the unexplainable too often? I think I, I think so. I think well, we we naturally, you know, the natural human desires we want to know, we we want to know the answers to everything, and I mean, there are scientists that are still boggled by things they can't figure it out, and I mean, we can we've learned a lot over time, and uh, but it, I, I think there's still going to be so much that it's that we'll never fully understand, and uh, that's why in the end, we need that relationship with God. Um, we cannot. You know, I mean, we can we can fake it till we make it. We can try to do things on this earth without him, but it's it's not going to be. Uh, to me, it would be very lonely. It really would. Um, and so, I, I he desires that trust. We got to know that he he knows what's right. And in the end, someday I believe everything will be brought to light, and uh, we'll understand why this happened and why this did not happen, etc. Yeah, yeah, that's good, Cody. Um... One of, the, one of the things that I attempt to do is if there are events, I call them catalytic events, and kind of as a coach and somebody who works with organizations and people, I try to identify why some people make change and why some people don't. And I've come to believe, this is an oversimplification, oversimplification of, of this theory, that there's two things, two ways that people make significant change in their life. Number one is they make a, an incredible, concerted, focused effort to change and do something different. Or number two, there's a catalytic event that forces that change. Do you, and this is such a hypothetical, weird kind of a question, because there's no way that we can do this uh, time continuum of what would have life been like this, but what, what is life like now? The things that you were doing now, the vision you mentioned earlier, can you picture any of that happening, the exposure that you've had, had that event not happened? I can't. I, I think it, 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 it allowed doors to open um, that probably uh, more than likely they never would have opened. I mean, I, I, you can only do so much. I mean, Grant, there was a lot of doors and a lot of things I got to do. I was in you know, thousands of people, did a lot of fun stuff before all that, but it was nothing to the extent of what it is today. And, you know, my audience more so in that time was children. I'd done some adult oriented events and, and Grant, I'll still speak with kids, but more so it's, it's, it's broadened the reach. And now I'm speaking in correctional facilities, hospitals to corporate college students, et cetera. And so, uh, I, I, I don't think it would have um, gone as far as what it has today. You know, it, it really allowed the, uh, the vision to get there all the more quicker. Um, but I say that, you know, but then again, there was a lot of work done behind the scenes. Uh, people think it just naturally happens and it doesn't. Um, I mean, there's a lot, a lot of effort you have to put into it. I mean, it's, you know, speaking ministry, these opportunities, uh, it's, you know, it, it's, you don't, you, it is a ministry, but you almost kind of have to look at it as though it's a business and you have to go at it from, you know, there's doors that do open up. God will, you know, people will call like that, but at the same time, people don't know that it's a lot of outbound reaching 
to a lot of these events and, and a lot of work behind the scenes to make things happen. But um, I think because of the story, because of the message, it's allowed me to, you know, gain access to, to television stations and, and do all these different things that I never would have if I hadn't gone through this. Yeah, I, w- I would venture to say that we would not be connected because, you know, we're leadership, business, ministry, and, you know, we love great stories. We love things like that. But, uh, you know, I would love to think that, you know, a juggler clown minister would possibly get my attention. But, you know, I hate to say, no, I don't actually hate to say it's just the way it is that, you know, near-death survivor, you know, 40% burns got my attention. We have a lot of messages coming in and, you know, people saying, hey, you know, can, can we share our message on the podcast? So, and this is a question that actually could irritate some people, but I know from your story and I know from reading the book that you'll be able to take it and run with it. What are some of the other, what, have, what are some of the benefits that you have realized and 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 you know it could be personal some things you've learned about yourself it could be just the fact that you're talking about but just go ahead and i'm just going to give you opportunity to list out as many of the benefits of that situation that you went through and then i'll go ahead and give people a prep i want to circle back and i want to talk about some of the struggles victories along the way because i know there's people listening in that want to hear a little bit more about not just the where you are now but a little bit of a along the way journey so tell me about some benefits yeah oh my goodness there has been so many incredible benefits number one it, it is the personal growth you grow deeper in your walk with god and you discover really what is most important in life and and you know pain that is that that quote of pain is our greatest teacher and it allowed me to grow and to mature in ways that i wouldn't have if i hadn't gone through this experience and granted i always feel i've I, as I've, I've had an old older old soul uh if you will uh but it has allowed me to be a little more um uh old in ways and and, and just more aware although i have my moments god knows I still don't have all the answers. I have so much to learn, but it taught me a lot. Um, and, and some of the things that you think should be of concern really aren't. Um, it, it allows you to refocus. And two, you know, going back to the core of, of why am I here on this earth? Why am I here on this earth? Who do I want to be? And what do I believe God is calling me to do? And when you get to the core of it, I believe I'm here because he has allowed me the privilege and the honor to be here. So it it, kind of just sets you in that right frame of mind to be able to go and do the things he's calling you to do. Now, the opportunities and the connections that have came about since this experience, I could make I could write a book just on that. Um, So many incredible people have came into my life, so many incredible opportunities. You know, I, like I said, hundreds of thousands of people I've been able to reach. The, the events that I'm speaking to, the people that I'm networking with, I released the book and, you know, it's done very well. And I know that there'll be more books in the future. And so it's um, very exciting to see the impact that it's making in people's life. And as much as it's making an impact in other people, I also say that it makes an impact in me. And so it's one of the most therapeutic things. And I think even as, you know, podcast hosts and doing all we are as as leaders and in this arena, we feel that it's, at least with me, it's like I get on stage and I'm sharing the message and I combine the story with it and the people are being encouraged. My goodness, that's just therapy. That's that's adding fuel to my tank. And so, uh, because we all, we need each other. So, so many benefits. I mean, I could go on and on. Yeah, that, that's good. And But you kind of led into a question that I had that jumped out at me when I was going through the book. And there was a word you used a few times called freedom. That is a word that I put a lot of thought into about the journey that I've been on. And I, I think it, I, you alluded to it, but I don't know that you just bluntly came out and said it in the book. Possibly. I may have missed it because I was reading pretty quickly, I'll admit. Are there any areas of your life where you have more freedom today than you did prior 
to your accident or prior to your recovery, because aren't all of us really hopefully working towards having more freedom? And, and I asked that possibly for a follow-up, but I'm going to leave it at that and let you just take that. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. I, and, and, and so there's, there's the personal side and then there's the business side of things too, or, or yeah, I guess we can say that. I mean, freedom as far as, and granted, it's still, it's still a work in progress. You know, we all, and that is very true. We all want to strive for freedom, uh, feeling that sense of freedom, but it requires effort and work to get to that place. And, you know, obviously in our walk with Christ, it's understanding that through Jesus and what he did for us, we can have that freedom from sin. We are, we are no longer a slave to sin. We are free. Him who the sun sets free is free indeed. Uh, and so there's that freedom that we gain from him. Uh, but from a, you know, I guess as far as a, a confidence side, there's that confidence in knowing uh, where I don't have to, granted, I, I want to, you know, you want to people please, you want to be liked by people, but there also comes that sense of freedom that, you know, in the end, I know your opinion about me really doesn't matter. And so I'm free to be who I believe God is calling me to be. Um, and so there's that sense of freedom. And then there's financial freedom that has came about because of this experience. God has been very good to me. Um, the book's done very well. The business is doing very well. Um, but at the same time, you know, it still requires effort and work on my part. Uh, but I think the biggest freedom is just embracing the fact that I have this story. I'm here on this earth. God has a purpose and a plan for me. And no matter what goes on in the world, I can have that inner peace in knowing that through Jesus Christ, I can do anything and I have that freedom uh, to be me, to who God is calling me to be in this present day and time. Yeah, that's, that's so good. I love the thought of that. There were like all things firing in, in my brain while you were doing that. It actually caused me to go back to the way you answered something earlier. And it seems like clarity. It seems like you've gained probably a great deal of clarity and, and one of the things that's interesting to me is that where we are in the world, I think with an event that's occurred worldwide with pandemic, I think a lot of people are going to get the opportunity, I'll use it as that way, the opportunity to gain more clarity. Whether they do or not is up to them, but I think they're going to get the opportunity. And I love what you said about the freedom of, of what other people think because that really does lead well into the questions that I want to ask about the scars and the, and the title of the book, because we are in a culture, in a society where the way we look and, and, and physically is so important in so many people's eyes. And you had this situation that literally disfigured you in so many ways. And, and, I loved what you just said, because what you said was you've gotten to the freedom, the place of freedom where you, 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 you want to love on other people, but you're not necessarily going to allow their opinions, thoughts, et cetera, dictate you. Talk a little bit about the physical, we've talked spiritual and things like that, but let's talk about the physical journey that you went on. Because, you know, I saw some of the images and I'm sure the first time you looked in a mirror, the first time you looked down at your hip or your hands or whatever, it was extremely traumatic. I'm guessing, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Talk a little about the physical. Let's start moving into talking about scars and the way you talk about scars in the book. And we'll, we'll start unpacking the book for people. Okay, yeah. Uh, physically, you know, as, as I'd shared, you know, I have the third and fourth degree uh, burns. Uh, second degree burns don't scar, uh, but still yet I had about 40% of my body um, severely burned. And so there is, uh, I do have a lot of scar tissue. My scars can be hidden. Um, although there's a, there's a connection there in today's world. Many people tend to hide their scars and they can do it very well. Uh, but in my case, you know, my hands, my arms, I have a couple spots on my lower back, my uh, left side got hit really hard. And then my left leg got really, you know, scarred pretty good. Uh, my right foot and I have a couple third degree spots on my right leg and, and the back part of my right leg. Fortunately, those are the only places very fortunate. Uh, but 
you know, still you're one minute, you're 23, your body's fine. Next minute, you know, you're now living with these scars and this disfigurement, so to speak. And, you know, it was very sh devastating to me. I remember the moment whenever I was in a rehab. Okay, so I was in the burn unit monitoring nurses and doctors. I had to relearn to walk. I had to relearn to use my hands, use the restroom on my own again, all the basics. Uh, but right whenever I had first learned to just stand up and they had just taken the, uh, I had a neck and back brace. I still had that on, but they had, I want to eat my body. I had never seen my body up to this point. They had taken me down when I was in the unit. They took me down to a tank to bathe me so I could see my arms and my hands. Um, I could very little see my uh, left side. There was a huge indention. I was like, there's a, there's a hole in my body. And this was before they did a, one of the graft surgeries. And, and it was just, so I was, my mind went all over the place. I didn't know what was up. And so uh, this was the full time, first time I got to see my full body. And so they bring in a big mirror and I stand up with the help of the doctors, nurses, my family was there. And to me, I, whenever I seen myself, I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. It was so emotional. I looked in my mind, I'm thinking it's like uh, something from a horror movie, you know, it's so disfigured. This is not, this is not what I'm used to. This is, this is, you know, how are people going to look at me? You know, how, you know, my, my future wife, you know, how is she going to be okay with this? All these thoughts start running through your mind. You know, my future children, how are they going to look at their dad? Um, you're just all over the place. But I sat back down on the side of the bed and I just, I wept so hard. It's one of the most emotional moments through this entire thing. And that was just seeing the damage that was done to my body after such an incident. So very traumatic. And, you know, as I shared, you know, I went through a lot of depression and so I had lost a lot of weight whenever I was in instay because my body was burning so many calories trying to heal. But then once I got out, you know, thinking that the recovery is, is going to be, all right, I'm going to bounce back from this fairly quickly. I didn't understand that it was going to be a long haul. There was still many more surgeries. I had to go through a lot more therapy. Uh, I, it just, it, it was so, so lengthy. It seemed like in my life, the world was going on, but, Everyone else was moving on with their life, but I felt stuck. I felt stuck in my circumstance. And so naturally, the only thing I thought I could control at that time, and the only thing I found enjoyment in was eating. So I, I ate like crazy. And I got to the point where back in 2016, I was up to about 370 pounds. And, and so today, I'm on the verge of hitting almost 200. And so I, I, I still have some more to go. Uh, but I, you know, it's, been, it's been a process to get from there to here. Um, and, and so that's another thing we could discuss as far as making consistent choices and trying to better yourself. But, um, you know, physically the body has been through a lot and, uh, but the scars learning to embrace them, it, it was, that's the biggest challenge right there. Yeah. I, I think this would be a good time for you to tell people, because I don't even think I mentioned it earlier. I think I may have put it in some of the promotion stuff we did, but go ahead and tell people the name of the book and tell us how that name came to be because you kind of led right into it with our conversation here, because I love the way you did it because a lot of people are going to think it's physical to truthfully, when I was reading the book, I was looking at more of the mental, even spiritual and other things. So I'm going to let you share the name and the subtitle and where that name came from. Yeah. And so I have the book, go figure, a uh, scar release breaking free of yesterday's troubles. And this uh, title came to me by going in and out of therapy. And so the um, occupational therapist was working on my hands. My, uh, she began to, you know, work hardcore trying to get some, my fingers to bend. They wanted to amputate three of my fingers, these two fingers and my pinky. And as you can kind of see, they're kind of stuck and like, I can't make a full fist. And so my pinky's kind of stuck. So it was a challenge, but, um, my web spaces in between my fingers, they had contracted to the point where I couldn't hold on to a bottle of water. And so she said, you know, Cody, you're going to need to go in and have surgery. And so, uh, Mind you, once again, burn survivors, we have contracture scars. And, and so when I went in, the surgeons assessed me and they said, all right, well, I need to do a surgical contracture release, otherwise known as a scar release. 
And what that is, is they go in and they cut the scar at its root and they allow you to be mobile again. Uh, because when a contracture scar occurs over the top of a joint, it can limit the mobility of that joint. So they, they go in, they get to the root of the problem and they cut it and it allows you to be mobile again and have that flexibility to move and function. Uh, but a scar release procedure does not remove the appearance of a scar. It only allows the mobility to move with the scar. And so I take that and connect it to the emotional. And I think about how in life, many people are scarred because of different things that occur. Maybe it's in their childhood. Maybe it was a, a divorce. Maybe it was a bad business deal. The list could go on. And when those scars occur over certain joints in our life, if they're not properly dealt with, we can find ourselves being limited in those areas in which we're needing to move and function. And so the, the way in freeing yourself, I talk about this scar release, getting to the root of the issue. And in the book, I talk about the different steps that we can do to search ourselves to really find out what is it that we're battling with in this area? Do we need to forgive somebody? You know, what, what is the, the reason as to why and why is this a problem? And um, also to loving yourself, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that don't fully love themselves. Um, and so it can get really deep in, in that realm, but in short, that's what it means. Yeah. And, and the, the whole scar release to me, because as I'm reading this, I'm thinking, oh, well, he's talking about the physical and all, but then the more you go down that, you know, you're really using scar as I'll use the term metaphor. I don't even think that's, that may not even be the right term. I think you're using it as a descriptive term to describe aches, pains, hurts, ailments that many of us have and, and probably need to identify. And I do love that reference to the way it's very graphic. Just be prepared people for, for the, for the graphic nature of that, because, you know, he just showed for those people watching the video, your fingers. And when he's talking about those webs, I mean, there's a, a lot of, uh, most likely extremely painful things that have to be done to release that. And I think a lot of people don't want to go down that path. They would rather just, you know, kick a little bit of sand, tuck it down underneath and just kind of keep going on. But that hinders us moving forward in mobility, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and people do it because we, we as humans, we want to run from pain uh, and we want to run from things that cause fear. Many people, um, don't want to face the problems that they're dealing with inwardly. So they, they find themselves running and running from themselves and their own problems. But there's a powerful quote I heard out there that, you know, fear is the one thing that gets smaller as you run towards it. And so the, the quicker you begin to address the issue, the better off you'll find yourself. Yeah, that's excellent. And, you know, there's so many things we could pull in. It's like, you know what? you don't necessarily go in and do that scar release by yourself. It's not a self, <laughs> you, you know, you had professionals, you had people that helped. And I think, um, I think that's, uh, that's uh, really, really, really cool and good. So I, you know, there's a few things that I would love for us to do here. Um, and I, I mean, I, I guess I want to ask, I always like to ask people that have written books about the process because I, I've just finished writing a novel myself and, and I actually thought, oh, this is to do this for so-and-so. It's going to be a blessing here. And I do think that's all part of the formula. But I like to people, especially people through situations like you've been through to say, what was the writing process like for you? And what did you learn about yourself during that process? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. And, you know, I, I never really seen myself writing a book, but a lot of people, they're like, Cody, you need to write one. You need to write one. Uh, and so I, I just began doing it. And, you know, they say when you're first starting, just, you know, write anything and everything. And so I instantly start writing out stories. And then from there, I'm like, how can I take this story? Because I, I wanted to write the book. Not, it's, not, it's not about me. I'm sharing my story through it but it's truly about the reader. And even whenever I go speaking at places, there's this thing of like, oh, it's about Cody's story. And it's really not. It's about the message that's being delivered to help you where you're at in your life. And so I wanted to write the book in such a way where I'm using analogies, metaphors 
storytelling to get the point across. And so then I started connecting the dots. All right, how can I use this to share this message? And, and so I had multiple editors. I hired a developmental editor. I think that she was out of Colorado and I had, I don't know how many words I had, probably 50,000 words. And I was so proud. And then she gets the book and then she sends it back to me and she cuts out like 20, 30,000 words. And I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding me. And so it's just too redundant. This is too much, too wordy. Uh, and so the book, you know, and, and so today, like the book is, I don't know how many words it is. I mean, it went through more editing and multiple editors. It, it took a lot. Uh, you know, it's not a big book, but it's very conversational. I'm very proud of it. It's the first one. I believe there will be more in the future. But writing it was very therapeutic to me. It allowed me to really go back to those moments and just think to myself, what was those thoughts in this moment? And really try to remember some of the stories and out of those stories, what is the messages that not only do I need to remind myself of, but others as well. Yeah. And that was good. You actually used a word I was about to ask is what was the therapy or the release for you during this process? Because it really was, you know, it not necessarily just a pure, this is what happened, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, but there was a lot of those things that are filled in for people that might be listening in and say, you know, I want more details about, you know, what the, what the recovery process was, what the rehab was like, they could find that in the book. We won't go into that here, but, but I, I, I did love the emotional. I did love the spiritual. I did love those aspects. Um, kind of always joke with people. I'm, I kind of like to do two or three encores. So I'm, I, I, I will say many times, this is my last big question, but, it's not that I'm lying, it's just other things come to mind. But one reference that you brought up in the book was the story of Joseph from the Old Testament, which, which a lot of us, very similar to Romans 8, 28, which God will use all things for good for those that love him, for those people that love him. But Joseph is also a story that many of us latch on to that go through stuff. Talk a little bit about, I'm, I'm going to have two things as we wrap up here, Cody. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to bring us into the landing strip here. Talk a little bit about the story of Joseph. And then Cody, I'm, I'm going to allow you some time to speak to whoever might be listening in here via video or the live or, or the podcast that has gone through some stuff and they're struggling they're hopeless. They have that either that dark place or depression or whatever that you talked about earlier. So Joseph, and then I'm going to allow you to just look right in and, and, and speak directly to someone who's going through a very difficult time and they're wanting some answers. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I love that. Thank you. Um, well, with the story of Joseph, I mean, Joseph was given a vision. Uh, God showed him what was going to be happening in his life. And However, there was such a, a journey getting to from point A to point B. And this journey was, you know, he would be in a, a place of high authority and, you know, very well off. And, you know, also his brothers being in the picture too, where they would be bowing down to him, uh, just different things. And so, but Joseph had shared this vision and, um, you know, it caused some, some conflict. And, you know, his, his life took a, a, an interesting roller coaster ride. You know, he ended up going into prison. Um, he, well, he's thrown into a ditch, then taken into prison. And he, you know, it was, it was a lot of uh, ups and downs. Uh, but ultimately, it was in those painful moments that put him in the position that he saw himself being. And so taking that story and combining it to even with what I have gone through, I have seen that the pain, yeah, I always had this vision. I knew it was going to impact a lot of people, but there was going to be a lot of pain before I would get to that place. And, and still, I, I know that life is a constant. I'm sure I'm certain I'll have more, many more painful moments. It's just part of life. Um, but to see that vision fulfilled, it took me a long time and a lot of pain to get there. And so I say all that to say this, that, you know, look at the situation. There's a couple different ways you can look at it. You can look at it with a victim mindset. Um, and you may have every right. You know, my mom, by the very fact that she told me, Cody, don't lose sight of your vision. She knew and understood that I had every right to play the victim card. 
And there's many people in today's world, if they're being honest with themselves, they can find themselves in that place. But my mom believed that there was something greater on the other side for her son. And just as she believed in me, I believe in you, everyone that is listening and watching this. And no matter what has happened yesterday, understand that there can be a better tomorrow. It's all a matter of what you do today. That's what makes the difference. And how do you truly want to live your life? What is the example that you're wanting to set? You know, like I, like I shared, I was a children's speaker and doing all these things. I'm preaching one thing. We can talk all day long, a good talk when life is going great. But then when disaster hits, you know, you're really preaching a message. Are you going to live up to what you're preaching? And all these kids, they were watching how they respond to this. And look in your life. Look at the people that's watching you. What is the message that you're wanting to give to them? Because you only have, you only have one life, one life to live. And it's your choice on how you want to live it. And, you know, I personally want to live my life to make a positive impact and serve others. And I know that when I'm serving others, I myself am being helped. Um, and, and I tell people that, you know, the, the process God, he'll direct, he'll make a way. and He does work all things together for the good. And however, a, but a lot of it comes to us being obedient and trusting him and taking actionable steps to get to that place and so whenever i go and i talk at places this is for anyone that is listening and if they want to download this they can download these steps i actually wrote them out there's a pdf download if they type their name and email they can download them directly from epicgameplan.com but the epic is an acronym the e stands for embrace challenges understand that challenges will always present themselves at one level or another it's something that we can't we can't escape then we have the i the i stands for implement change implement those lessons, apply those lessons, uh, or sorry, I, I take that back. I messed up the acronym. I'm getting ahead of myself. We have the E and then we have the P. So we have the P is provide perspective. All right. So look at the situation differently. What are the lessons I can learn out of this experience? Reframing the situation. And then we have the I, which is implement those changes, implement the lessons, apply them to our life. And then we have the C, which is celebrate celebrate your story and out of that serve others and i have seen that to be such a beneficial thing in helping me get from you know this devastating event to where i am now and uh, just know that there's hope and I, and I will tell you with one powerful quote that i love one of my mentors gave it to me i have a big picture of it up here on my office wall and it's by caitlin walsh and it says the key to success is playing the hand you were dealt like it was the hand that you wanted and so how are you going to play this hand that you may have been dealt in your present life at this time? And I will say from a Christian mindset, I know ultimately, you know, I go into businesses, I'll speak in corporate, you know, and I can say all those other things, but I'll say the best thing that you can do is number one, surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Put your hope and trust in him and allow him to heal you, to restore you and get you to the place that you need to be. And understand that just, just as my brother Tim said, that God will work all things together for the good. There is a better tomorrow. Keep your head high. It won't be easy. I don't know your story. I don't, all I can say is what I've been through. I'm only an expert at one thing, and that's me. So I ain't going to act like I know what you're going through because I don't. But I do know that pain, it reveals itself in many different forms. But if you find yourself dealing with pain today, I believe with all my heart that there's a Lord and Savior that he is a master at healing and restoring and taking that pain away. And it all starts with you taking the hand you were dealt and saying, God, it's yours. From here, what would you have me to do? That's the very first step in the step to gaining that life of freedom that we so long for. Yeah, Cody, that was that was so good. And I appreciate you sharing from your heart there. I think that message is going to really resonate. I, I think what I would love for you to do now is share. You mentioned a couple of things that people could, could find you, but uh, how can people connect with you? And we'll include it all in the notes, but uh, you know, websites, where, where can they get the book? Where can they can just find you and reach out to you and, and follow up with this message that you've uh, given us? Yeah. Okay. I, I apologize. I was kind of cutting out some. I did the last question. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I was just asking, how can people connect with you? What is the best way that they can get in touch with you and find you either online, get the book and, uh, and just continue, I guess, continue interacting with you? How can people do that? We'll include it in the notes. Okay, yeah. Uh, so if they go to my website, codyburns.com, C-O-D-Y-B-Y-R-N-S.com, on there, there is access to my, all my social media links. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, at the Cody Burns. Um, there's a, a link on there where they, if they want to download the first chapter of the book for free, they certainly can. If they want the steps that I just shared, epiclifegameplan.com, put your name and email in. You'll be able to download it. It's a 10-page uh, informative sheet, really just free that you can use both in your personal and even in your business life. Um, it's helped a lot of people. People tend to love that. If you want my email, feel free to reach out info at codyburns.com. I'd be more than happy to connect. Thank you for that, Cody. And I so appreciate you sharing. I knew that this would be a fun conversation and it has. The only thing probably is that we could continue the dialogue, but, uh, but um, so the, the thing I'd love to do, last question I'd like to ask is the title of our show is Seek, Go, Create. Three words that you may be able to guess the origin of some of them and kind of what it means. But I like to ask guests as a final question, which one of those words jumps out at you and why the most? Which one resonates the most? Seek, go, create. And I did not give you any prep for this. So this is going to be totally... <laughs> We're, we're going to get the, we're going to get it, aren't we? I, I love it. I love it. This is fun. So it just one of those words, because I tell you all three of them, I find myself doing so my goodness. Um, I think I would just say seek, you know, seek. Um, and we can say from a business standpoint, seek out opportunities to serve and make a difference. But then from a spiritual point, one of the greatest things we can do in this day and hour is seek almighty God. And so I find myself at a place where, you know, I, I know that all the answers to what, I, what I'm needing is, is found in him. And so that all begins with seeking him first and making him a priority. And I have to confess, there are days where I don't do that. Unfortunately, I'm not perfect, uh, but I do. Um, I, when, I, when I have those times, I'm thinking, my goodness, why did I hold it off? And so uh, let me say that from a place of vulnerability and understand that I have done it and, and will continue to do it. And I know that it makes a difference. And so seek God, seek him first and foremost. And out of that, everything you need will, will come into play. Yeah, Cody, that is so good. Thank you so much for sharing with just myself. If it was a conversation between you and I, I would have enjoyed it so much. But knowing that others are listening in are going to be able to, to listen and share this. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. I know you've got organizations, you've got your foundation, your ministries. I encourage people to go check those out. But above all, I encourage people to go get the book. Like I said, I read it yesterday and it was a blessing to me. I enjoyed it thoroughly and I know other people will. If you've listened in and you want to continue the dialogue, the conversation, we encourage you to do that. You can find Seek Go Create on almost all the socials. We're Seek Go Create, Facebook, Instagram. We've even recently joined Clubhouse. So we actually do some things over on Clubhouse. And of course, we're on LinkedIn, Twitter, and the others too. So join in and uh, just uh, ask questions. Even if it's something that I think we need to reach back out to Cody, we'll do that. Bring him back on and have the conversation. We want to hear from you. If you need more information from us, seekgocreate.com is the best place to go. We encourage you to do that. Make sure we've got your best email address so you can stay connected. And until next time, when we have another great conversation like we did today, I just ask and pray that you be all that you were created to be. Mm -hmm.